Okay, hey. So welcome everyone, thanks for attending my talk uh, titled Test Your Test, The Do's and Don'ts of Testing, where I'll be mainly talking about testing, the good, the bad, the ugly. And my name is Kurt Willis, you might also know me as FaZe. Um, I work at Trail of Bits as a security engineer and researcher, and at Trail of Bits we work with some of the industry's leading protocols. And uh, you might know us from some of our program analysis and fuzzing tools such as Slither, Caracol, Echidna, and Medusa. And let's get into it. So as an overview, for those of you who have attended my talk at TrustX, um, this will recap some of the points there and then I'll also um, be highlighting some additional examples. So I'll start, start off why the, uh, for, uh, with the motivation for this topic, why this topic is important to me. Um, then I'll mainly be talking about some examples of testing shortcomings and um, talk about exploring various testing strategies and um, then I'll be sh giving a, a, an example of offensive testing and then I'll conclude with some takeaways. So let's talk about the role of testing. Um, I think it's pretty clear in blockchain why we test, uh, where we have millions at risk we want to make sure that we identify any kind of faults, any kind of unexpected behavior that could be abused and exploited. Um, with more advanced testing, we can also validate invariance of our system, so make sure that certain properties hold within our um, protocol for any kind of stateful fuzz transactions that we can send. And um, we could also use unit tests and fuzz tests to kind of specify a certain behavior. Um, so for example, if we have unit and fuzz tests for ERC721, we can share those and make sure that they hold on other implementations. Um, generally, we want to build up confidence and trust in the performance of our code that it does exactly what we want it to do and doesn't do anything unexpected. Um, in this way, tests also act as a, a safety layer between um, future code updates um, as a kind of regression test. So if we inadvertently introduce a kind of, any kind of bug, we wanna make sure that our test catches this. And by doing so, or we'd like to basically specify the behavior as good as possible. And um, one thing I wanna make clear here in this talk is that no testing method is foolproof. You might always miss some certain kind of edge cases. It might be infeasible to cover every kind of edge case or um, your tooling might contain biases. Um, so that's why I want to make clear that testing is an ongoing process of refinement. It's not a final endpoint where you kind of reach and then you can be 100% certain that your code is doing exactly what you want it to do. So I'll talk about the motivation for this topic. Um, basically, this comes from some of my re reflections on past shortcomings. So before joining Trail of Bits, I was a developer. And as a developer starting out um, with Solidity, I made bugs. Every developer makes bugs, it's normal, and it's important to learn from these bugs. And with every bug that I made, I made sure that I would um, use this to improve my development and testing process and to learn from it. And this ultimately also became a driver for becoming more security oriented and uh, made me arrive where I am today. So one important example that stood out to me and was very memorable was when I was working on ERC-721A and trying to include an optimization. So without going too much into detail on how ERC-721A works, just uh, remember that it's basically supposed to work like ERC-721, like um, making sure that ownership in the um, NFT contract is consistent, but it makes some a few assumptions like with for example, sequential minting and batch minting. And um, basically ownership is only explicitly committed when it is needed. Um, and it's kept implicitly when it's not needed. And my idea for optimizing this was um, that I saw that um, basically this check for implicit or explicit um, ownership was being made on every transfer, and I saw that you could optimize this by keeping a Boolean value in the same ownership slot, which was already warm. Um, yeah, without going into too much detail, just remember that the basic idea of the implementation is quite simple. It's supposed to behave like ERC-721, but because of this nuance in this implementation, it creates some pretty interesting um, edge case scenarios. And a bit about my development and testing approach at the time, I would describe it as very test-driven. I was leaning heavily onto my tests. Um, I was 
writing tests before the actually writing the implementation. And the idea here was that sufficient testing will uncover any kind of deviation from my specification. Um, also, I had this notion of quality through quantity, which is not a bad thing. However, in this case, um, it actually led me to lose sight of the bigger picture and to miss some of the nuances of this implementation. Because what ended up happening was that I wrote these unit tests. Um, I came up with certain edge case scenarios, which I thought would cover this specific behavior. Um, so imagine my surprise when I got this comment saying that there was a bug in my implementation. My first response was a bit of a response of a shock and asking how, because these tests had been running in addition to Soulmate's ERC721 unit and fuzz tests. Um, so I thought I had sufficiently tested it, but apparently I hadn't. Um, I created a new edge case which caught this specific um, bug. It failed, I applied a patch, and um, now all tests passed, right? That's great, except for not quite, because I had introduced another bug, which I then noticed, but still this left me in a bit of a state of shock, and this was a valuable lesson for me. So one thing that kind of stood out for me when I reflected on this experience of what was going wrong, um, I noted that I, had a, I was lacking a systematic testing approach and structure, um, and I think this was probably the main issue here. I was just randomly thinking of edge cases that could be important, but I was kind of neglecting the nuances of the actual implementation. Um, yeah, so missing important edge cases. Um, also, I was kind of testing multiple things at once in one test, um, highlighting my kind of unstructured approach at the time. Um, oh yeah, and for more on this, you can refer to Paul's talk with um, the branching technique, which is pretty helpful, but sometimes it's simply infeasible to go through every, every single branch. Um, and I think what would have helped me the most in this case would have, would have been to have expressive and meaningful fuzz test, uh, testing for multiple transfers of random IDs and actors. And one thing that I really learned here was that 100% code line and branch coverage does not mean that you've covered 100% of the possible states. All this is to say good testing is quite hard, good and effective testing. Um, and to kind of highlight some of the things that I want to talk about today and uh, which, you can, which we can maybe learn something from, I've kind of condensed down some examples of how testing can look good, but in the end it's bad. So here, for example, we have this, um, we're testing WAD conversions, so we have two functions that convert to and from WAD units. Very simple, we just multiply and divide by the WAD constant. And um, we test this by making a round trip, calling to and from, and in the end we wanna end up with the same outcome. And we include a check for overflow, so if we pass this threshold, we expect to catch this overflow case. And um, we use any fuzzer of a choice, uh, or in this case it's Foundry, and we run it with 10,000 runs and we get this result. Right, is this good testing? Does this convince you? Um, does anybody see any issue with this? Okay, well, um, to highlight what's going wrong here is that you can actually create, in addition to this fuzz test, a unit test with, which calls, which simply does one thing, it calls the fuzz test with a very specific value. And that is the boundary value, and we see here that basically uh, this interesting case where the fuss test passes, but the unit test which calls the fuss test with a specific value fails. So um, here the greater equal should have been only a greater. And um, yeah, here it's basically highlighting, know your tool, understand your tool, know its strengths and weaknesses. In this case, um, the tool wasn't performing static analysis on this value, um, if we would have uh, used a tool that would have performed static analysis, we could have caught this. But that's not to say that like um, using this fuzzer is bad, it's just um, to simply know how to use it. And we'll go into an example of how to more effectively use it. And um, you should definitely not re rely on a single type of test. So here um, you might think that, okay, writing one general fuzz test is gonna capture everything, but it doesn't. Um, so one thing, in order to see how we could have restructured our tests to make it more effectively, um, we would like to 
reduce any kind of complex decision trees in our tests. So we had this if condition before. I mean, it wasn't very complex, but often you'll see that in more um, elaborate protocols that they have these um, kind of complex decision trees in the beginning of their tests. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that our test is doing exactly one thing, right? We want to ensure that we have enough coverage for that specific test case because it could have been that we would have had one case where in the previous function where we had the reverting case and 9,999 for the passing case. And that would have been insufficient coverage for that specific case. So we want to make sure our test does one thing. Um, and for doing that, we split the test by its expected outcome and behavior. And um, we ensure enough coverage for those test cases. But also, we want to make sure that we get coverage around the boundary points. And in, for these, you should normally be writing extra fuzz tests or unit tests, um, which would have caught the issue here. Um, but here, we're also just making use of foundry's bound function, which adds a explicit bias towards the minimum and the maximum values. Um, also, we should be more explicit with our um, revert catching. We don't want to catch any kind of reverts. They, it could happen that the function reverts for some unexpected reason, and if we just use a general expect revert, we would be catching any kind of reverts. Um, so yeah, we want to be as explicit as possible with defining the behavior. And uh, another example is for um, testing wad multiplication. So here we have a MoWAD function, which multiplies two um, uint values. And because it's in wad units, we have to, in the end, normalize again. Um, again, just like before, we have a check for overflow, and we have to include it in the function because we're using unchecked arithmetic here. And we write a test for this. Um, pretty simple. We check for overflow. If we expect it, then we try to catch it. And if not, then we assert that we get the right value. Um, again, we run the fuzzer, uh, see this result. And um, yeah, does this sufficiently convince you? Does anyone see the issue? OK, well. Here, um, we're using a incorrect Berlin operator. We're using the or operator where we should have been using the and. Um, however, because we just blindly reused the code, we copy pasted it into our test, um, there's no way for the fuzzer to find this, right? Um, and this can be less obvious. You can be reusing helper functions, which are untested, and then you can be running into the same mistake. So. For this, it's always important to re-implement the logic from a different an angle. Um, and I mean, this might be, um, so this could also be like, for example, on a protocol where you are asserting that certain values are sorted, um, you might want to create a additional function which explicitly sorts all the values every time you run it. Um, and also, what we could have done in this case to catch this mistake is to test multiple adjacent properties. So here we are testing for the commutative property. If A times B doesn't overflow, then we want to make sure that it equals B times A. And this would have also caught that issue. Um, also include unit tests for special cases, right? Don't just rely on the fuzz test. So here, a simple unit test for 0 times 0 would have also caught this. Um, and then. Uh, if you have a reference implementation at hand, at hand you might want to use differential fuzzing, um, or you can even use non-solidity implementations with uh, the FFI G code. Um, so that was mainly about defensive testing, trying to make your make sure that your uh, your tests are as robust as possible, trying to co cover every single um, angle and really trying to specify the behavior of your implementation. And now we'll talk a bit about offensive testing, where um, in contrast, we simply want to invalidate some certain invariant. And for this, we'll be looking at primitive finance, um, back then called Hyper. Um, so this was an audit that we conducted in January, and a bit about the protocol. It's a constant function market maker with time-dependent curves, which enables options like trading. Um, it had features such as a central pool balance accounting and batch swapping functionality. And um, something that we noted, or that was obvious, was that it was using very non-trivial function approximations, such as like the Gauss um, probability density function and inverse error correction function. 
Um, it was making heavy use of assembly and incon using inconsistent grounding methods, which is, um, which is why we decided to um, simply create a test which would fuzz the swap function. So our initial idea was, okay, if there's some inconsistent rounding, this could maybe be used to exploit the protocol and to extract tokens from it. Um, so here is a um, initial proof of concept that we wrote. Um, we simply fuzz the, the, um, the swap function. So first, Alice, a honest actor, creates a honest pool, consider it uh, ETH die. Then Bob comes along, creates a malicious pool, say ETH and some, uh, yeah, some other token. And um, Bob swaps back and forth, and he tries to extract some value from this. If that succeeds, then Bob withdraws all of the assets and records the asset gain. Um, and if this, if this whole um, execution succeeds, we report the, the test failure. And um, this was what was happening initially. It was very non-trivial to uh, get everything to run accordingly, and we were running into many reverts. So what we decided to do was to simply kind of try catch everything. Like if um, if we stumbled into a reverting case, then we would simply ignore it. We only wanted that one test case that would invalidate this invariant and uh, allow us to extract some tokens. And um, so we continued this approach. We let the fuzzer run for a few weeks, and we continued on manual review at the same time. Um, yeah, so, but then after some point, we realized, okay, this was going nowhere, um, and we decided to refine the te uh, testing strategy. So for one, we had to address all of these reverts, and we had to make sure that we were properly bounding the parameters. So all of these parameters that you see here, um, they had to, we had to define their limits, and this was also non-trivial because um, some of the parameters depended on other parameters, and um, there was some very odd rounding behavior in there. Um, also, it was important to sanity check the setup, so make sure that we actually could reach the very end of this execution here. Um, because, for example, one thing um, where we had to question some of our assumptions was that we assumed that, okay, um, we wanna make the pool controller equal Bob so that Bob would um, receive a beneficial swapping fee. Um, it turns out there was a, another mistake in the protocol which essentially required the swapping fee to be taken in as WETH. And we hadn't given permissions for this to transfer um, the WETH token. So um, yeah, uh, another thing uh, which helped out was creating the swap back and forth as a batched instruction. Um, instead of like two single transactions. And then also there was this assumption that we had in the end that Bob should gain both tokens. Um, and this was simply done because Bob could either go from quote to asset and back to quote or the other way around. And in the end, we just wanted to see whether tokens could be extracted and report that case. Um, but due to some weird uh, rounding behavior here, in the end, we, in, in many of the cases where we actually succeeded with this exploit, we required a minimum of one single token um, of the quote token when extracting asset tokens, which was odd behavior, but again, um, that's where we had to like, question these assumptions. And also, we only need to extract one valid token, right? Uh, we can create a, mal a malicious token and use that to extract the, the actual valuable token. So yeah, um, and that in the end led us to uh, allow to create this proof of concept. So some conclusions here on the offensive testing side, um, it required a persistent dynamic approach. Um, and again, like we only want to actively, we want to find one potential crack because this can lead to an exploit and we only want to invalidate one invariant. Instead of before we saw the defensive case where we want to robustly test our implementation and tested from multiple different ang angles. Um, here it was very important to question any kind of assumptions that we were making in the tests and to validate our entire setup. Um, so I'll wrap up with some key takeaways from this talk, and that is to um, treat your test as production code. So your, your tests can also contain bugs just the same way that your production code can. 
And um, the risks here are that this could lead to a false sense of confidence. It could lead to misleading outcomes where, as we've seen, you might take some, uh, some precondition as um, the true condition, which might not reflect the actual implementation, or you could simply mask bugs, and that's not good. Um, you should be aware of any kind of limitations in your testing and your tooling, so your tests can only go so far. You might not cover every single edge case. Your fuzzer might not cover every single edge case. Your tooling actually can contain bugs, so with some of the formal verification tooling, like maybe when translating your code um, to the, um, the formal verification system, there might be some errors in this translation. Um, as I've shown, um, it's important to explore like different testing strategies and techniques, not to rely on a single one. Um, and it's also important to examine any kind of assumptions, uh, preconditions, and conclusions that you make on your tests. Like, are these tests valid for any kind of realistic scenario? Are you capturing um, all these important edge cases? And um, in the end, you can also test your tests, right? You can create meta tests. Um, one thing that is very helpful is to introduce deliberate bugs into your tests. So for, for example, on the offensive testing case, um, you could just remove some of the invariants, remove the swap fees, like introduce mutants, and make sure that your tests actually execute this and find those bugs. Um, and also, as we've seen before, um, from the talk before, you can use some kind of mutation testing, like Gambit, um, Universal Mutator, Vertigo, and we also have our own tool called Nessassist, which works a bit differently, it mutates your tests instead of your, the source code. Yeah, so that's it from my side, and you can scan the QR code to arrive at the blog post, which is a bit more in-depth, and it shows some additional examples, um, and yeah, you can stay in touch, and are there any questions? <laughs> Awesome, thank you so much. Are there any questions in the room? We have a few minutes. Yes, here's one. I'm just gonna give you my mic. Hey, like, great talk. Uh, just wanna check, like, how much testing is actually required for a protocol, and like, how do we know that the protocol is tested enough, like? The question was, how do we know the protocol is tested enough? Yeah, you said, like, 100% uh, line coverage is not equal to 100% state coverage, so, like, most protocols use the coverage to identify the uh, testing suite strength. So like, is there any other metric that we can use to find how much uh, testing is done or like? Yeah, I mean, there, there are certain metrics that you can follow. So like I mentioned, there is uh, code line coverage, branch coverage, um, but these are in the end all just metrics. And like I showed, you can have all of these covered and then you can still be missing some of the testing, uh, some of the states that are important. Um, then there's also like the mutating score, which show how robust your tests are. Um, in the end, it's it's very hard to give any kind of precise answer to this. Um, you'll just probably have to write as much uh, tests to make sure that you have the confidence that your your code is actually doing what it's doing, and you should add redundancy to it and like. Not, uh, not think that you've arrived at one single endpoint where you're done with all of the testing. Yeah. Any more questions? Now is the time. If not, I'm sure Kurt will also stick around for a while and you can maybe catch him over lunch. Um, okay, thanks Thank so you. much.